Okay, today what we want to do is finish up our discussion of these interest rate differentials, uh, the explanation for why interest rates on some loans differ from those on others. Uh, the way we ended up our previous discussion was by talking about the effect of term on interest rates. Term of what term of the loan? Is it a short-term loan? Is it a long-term loan? And what we basically had was two different effects that we wanted to talk or that we talked about. Uh, the one was the expectations theory. Expectations about what? Anybody remember? Future short-term interest rates. And what we said is this. Short-term interest rates today, let's say the one year interest rate today is equal to, and we'll just make up a number here for illustration purposes, maybe 3%. Okay. And what we are saying is this. If people in credit markets, borrowers and lenders alike, if they expect short-term interest rates to just stay there forever, then that would predict a yield curve that looks like this. Because then people would be indifferent between borrowing or lending, short-term or long-term. If you said, hey, I need to borrow money. Should I borrow money for one year or two or three or four or 10 or 20 or 30? What you'd say is, it doesn't really make any difference if I just take out a long-term loan or a short-term loan. Because I could borrow the money this year for 3%, and then if I need the money for five years, let's say to buy a car, then what I'd do is, a year from now, I'd go out and borrow some money for a one-year loan and pay off the first loan, and I'd just be paying 3% for that year. And then for the third year, I'd go out and borrow some money and pay 3% and pay off with the proceeds of that loan, pay off the previous loan. And each year I would just borrow some money, pay off the loan before, and i pay 3% for that year. Every single year my interest cost would be 3%. Or I could go out and get a five-year loan today and just pay 3% every single year. I'm indifferent between the two. And the lenders would feel the same way too. I could loan the money out for 3% for an entire five-year period, or I could just lend my money out for a year for 3% and get paid back at the end of the year and then make out another loan 3%. I'm indifferent. I don't care. So that's if we think that interest rates, short-term interest rates will stay at 3% forever. But if we think that short-term interest rates are going to be higher in the future, yes, today they're 3%, but I think they're going to go up to 4% next year then I, as a lender, say, I'm not willing to lend my money out for a long term for 3%, because, yeah, I can lend my money out today for 3%, but in the future, short term, it will be 4%. So why wouldn't I just, like, basically hold back and not lend my money out short term? Did I say that wrong? Hold back and not lend it out long term. Let me go back and say that again. If I think, if today's short term interest rate is 3%, and the long term interest rate is 3%, but I think the short-term interest rate will be higher in the future, then I will not make a long-term loan and lock myself in at three. What I would do instead is make a short-term loan. I would prefer that because next year I can get more on, that short, on, on next year's short-term loan. And so there would be no supply of short-term funds, of long-term funds, there we go, and then that would mean long-term interest rates would go up because there's such a small supply of long-term credit. And so with that expectation of higher short-term interest rates in the future, long-term interest rates, maybe the two or three or five-year maturity, would have a higher yield. We'd have an upward sloping curve. If I could loan my money out for one year or for two or three or five or whatever at 3%, but I thought short-term interest rates would be lower in the future than 3%, then I say, you know, I'd love to lock in a 3% rate because if what I do is I just lend my money out for one year, I, yeah, I get 3%, the same as if I loan it long term. But next year, when I renew that loan or when I make another loan, a short-term loan, I'm only going to get 2%. I don't like that. So I would refuse 
to make short-term loans, I'd love to make long-term loans. And by loving to make long-term loans, there'd be a big supply of long-term credit and that would drive long-term interest rates down. And so we get a negatively sloped yield curve. Now this is an independent effect of just what happens due to expectations. And then what we said is there's another thing that happens and that is interest rate risk. And I called it liquidity preference. By liquidity, and the reason we use the term, it's this. Assets have various attributes, right? Assets have this attribute. Is it risky or not so risky, right? There is an attribute about this asset. Is its price predictable? Is its value predictable? Okay, and so when we start talking about predictability, what we say is this, you know, if, if let's say we talk about a bond or a loan, and it's got some face value, of course, it's got some coupon interest rate, of course, but then it's got a term to maturity, one year or maybe 30 years. The one year bond has a price that's very predictable. Its price is not gonna fluctuate much due to interest rate risk. But the one with a 30 year maturity has a lot of interest rate risk. I've done this sort of, you know, interest rates up, bond price down and vice versa. And there's a bigger fluctuation in the price depending on term to maturity. And so the price of the one year security is very stable. The price of the 30 year security is very unstable. And so that means it's, this is more liquid, more predictable price, and here would be less predictable price if it's longer term, and that would be more liquid. And then what? The longer term would be less liquid. And so when we talk about liquidity preference, what we're saying is this. All other things the same. If I'm gonna get 5% or 3% or whatever number you want, if I'm gonna get 3% or 5%, no matter what term to maturity, I'll take the one year maturity because its price is not gonna fluctuate as much. I'd rather avoid that uncertainty that's associated with a 30 year bond. And so then what we did is we do, drew two supply and demand diagrams just as we did before. Let's talk about, we'll use 5% as the interest rate or yield. Here's quantity of 30 year credit, long term. And quantity of one year credit. And what we're saying is this, at first maybe these yields are the same, but then the liquidity preference or the desire to avoid interest rate risk asserts itself. And what we say is, I think I'd try to avoid this interest rate risk. I'll shift my supply of funds away from that interest rate risk toward the stability, toward the greater, liqui more liquid asset. And so when the supply of credit shifts, we get S2, a smaller supply of long-term credit, a, a greater supply of short-term credit. Interest rates change, maybe this is 5.6% and maybe this is 4.2%. There's no need for these to adjust by the same amount. And so now what we get is a term premium Uh, in this particular case, 5.6 minus 4.2 is what, 1.4%? And this is from one to 30 years. That is to say that difference in term, we get a 1.4% premium. So to come back over here, this tells us that we're always gonna have an upward sloping yield curve. there will always be a higher rate of return on longer term loans and bonds than on shorter. Now, the fact of the matter is there isn't always. But because of this one effect, 
the liquidity preference or the desire to avoid interest rate risk. Because of this one effect, there would always be that. So there's always a tendency for yield curves to slope upward. And that's what I told you. In real life, we go out and look at yield curves day after day after day. And on average, 90 days out of 100, they're going to slope upward. But the net yield curve that we have adds both of these together. When we go get a newspaper in the morning and look at those, and we get a yield curve, they have these different shapes because of both effects working together. Okay, and so if we don't get a yield curve that looks just like that, if we get a yield curve that's horizontal, what would a horizontal yield curve mean? It would mean this. It would mean that, you know what? Our desire to avoid the interest rate risk would give us an upward sloping yield curve, but the fact of the matter is that expectations about what's gonna happen to short-term interest rates and one and two and three years down the road and so forth. <coughs> Those expectations are that short-term interest rates will come down and that effect lowers the yield curve to here. And for us to get a perfectly flat yield curve, these two things would have to exactly offset each other. And that's kind of unlikely, isn't it? But it's possible. It may be that we think short-term interest rates are gonna rise in the future and then if we think short-term interest rates will rise in the future, then what we would get is these two effects are both pushing us up and we get a steep yield curve. We get a yield curve that doesn't just reflect this liquidity preference or a desire to avoid interest risk, but it also reflects our expectations. Steep yield curve. And we have a pretty steep yield curve today in credit markets. From the short end to the long end is Today, and this is very untypical, but like 4% almost. And that's steep, okay? If we get a negatively sloped yield curve, this would be the yield curve with only, what, liquidity preference built in, and so there would have to be a huge decrease, let me say it differently, expectations of short-term interest rates would have to build in a huge decrease in those short-term interest rates and our expectations to give us that downward sloping yield curve. Okay, or negatively sloped yield curve. Now, what would cause that to happen? And I'm shifting gears just a little bit. What would cause that to happen? How would we think boy, interest rates are going to go, short-term interest rates are going to go way down one and two and three years from now from where they are today. Two things. I already mentioned one to you. If, oh, I've already mentioned them both to you, back when we talked about that loanable funds model. We said interest rates are pro-cyclical. And so if what you thought is, gosh, we're going to have a recession, we're not in a recession yet, but we're going to be in a recession six months from now or a year from now. Then what we'd say is, I think interest rates are going to be lower in six months or a year. And so the expectation of a recession would be the expectation of lower interest rates in the future, and that would give us this kind of an effect from the, uh, the expectations part of the story, and then that's potentially enough to give us a negatively sloped yield curve. Maybe just a flat yield curve. Maybe we get this yield curve because of here's the avoidance of interest rate risk and then expectations say, oh gosh, interest rates are going to go down in the future, so maybe we get a flat yield curve. Or, but So flat or downward sloping, they're both kind of telling us people expect short-term interest rates to go down. And one reason may be we expect a recession and interest rates are pro-cyclical. And the other could be, you know, we've got quite a bit of inflation right now, and I think that inflation is going to go away. I think the Federal Reserve is getting busy, they're fighting inflation, and maybe we have 8% inflation today, we don't really, but we have 8% inflation today, I think that's going to be 1% two years from now, and I think they're just going to keep those rates, that inflation rate down. And so then with the Fisher equation, that Fisher effect of interest, uh, inflation gets built into interest rates, if you think inflation is going away, you think interest rates are going to be lower in the future. And so if we expect recession, if we expect and this is sometimes what comes along with the recession, lower inflation in the future, negatively sloped yield curve. So what I'm saying to you is this. If we see, we get the newspaper out and we see a yield curve that's got a negative slope to it, what we should think is this. People in credit markets are forecasting recession. 
and that we've got a tight monetary policy. Tight means contractionary. Means like we are not putting money into the economy. The Federal Reserve's not, and we're going to have a recession. And so this is kind of a signal. There's interest rate and term to maturity. If we see, observe in real life, a negatively sold fuel curve, that's given us a forecast. People in credit markets think there's going to be a recession and that inflation's coming down. So now what we've done is two different things. One of them, I said that we can look at interest rate differentials, maybe interest rate on triple B bonds minus the interest rate on triple A bonds over time. This is not term to maturity, but over time, what we said is there may be some normal differential here. So we move along, and may, I don't even know what normal would be. 1%? It just depends on the situation. But maybe we're going along. This is 1%. And then we see this start to go up at some point. Then what that is telling us is, you know what? People are worried that these companies may go bankrupt, triple B rated companies, whereas these won't. And so they're trying to avoid that risk due to a recession. And so if we see that risk differential rising, that's signaling recession from the credit markets. If we see a negatively sloped yield curve, that's signaling recession from the credit markets. And what I told you is this. I said it once. I'll say it again. I told you back when we were on this subject. For an economist to come along, and just say, we're going to have a recession, or whatever. Hey, guess what? There's no cost to being wrong. I can say recession tomorrow, and tomorrow you come in and say, there was no recession. I go, yeah, I was wrong. OK, now here's what I'm uh, forecasting today. The people who are making these forecasts, they aren't really forecasting for the world. They're saying, here's what I think. We're going to be in a recession in three months or six months. I'm going to. Get my money and run. I'm going to get away from that situation. And those people are very sincere because they're not taking 50 bucks or 100 bucks. They're taking 100 million dollars. I'm going to move it. Guess what if you're wrong? Here's what's happening here. Double B or triple B interest rates are yielding a lot more than triple A interest rates. And if you're wrong, if you go, oh, I'm going to get my money and run. I'm taking it out of that risky stuff and putting it in the safe stuff. Then what that means is this. I just moved $100 million, let's say, and there was really nothing to run and hide from. And if I left that $100 million in those triple B bonds, I'd be earning an extra $10 million a year. But I ran and hid. And I say $10 million a year. That would be right. $1 million a year. I ran and hid from that. And so I didn't make that extra million dollars. And over here across the street, there's another money manager. And that guy didn't run and hide. He didn't think, this money manager that I'm competing with, he didn't think there was going to be a recession. And he left his money in the triple B bonds. And he made an extra million bucks from $100 million invested. And then at the end of the year, people are trying to decide, uh, who do we want to manage our money next year? Oh, that guy across the street made an extra $1 million. This guy, I, I didn't make that $1 million. And so what will happen is investors will just start saying, oh, we want to withdraw money from our, your mutual fund and put it in that one across the street. And all of a sudden, my salary is going down. Or maybe I'm out of work. So what I'm saying to you is this is really sincere. This is not an economist going, oh, we're going to have a recession, or oh, we're not going to have a recession. This is not just some, somebody making an empty forecast like, do you think it will rain tomorrow? This is somebody who's putting their job on the line, and they study this hard. And I used an example of uh, $100 million. There are multi-billion dollar mutual funds, billions of billions, that do this. I think, I may be wrong, I think the very biggest mutual fund company is uh, invest in bonds, and so it would be applicable to this kind of a story. I think it's by a guy named Bill Gross. PIMCO, P-I-M-C-O, I think is the mutual fund company, and he invest, I don't know, I'm going to say two, three hundred billion dollars, hundred billion dollars. And so if he says recession and he's wrong, 
He takes his money on triple B bonds and runs over here and hides it. And then on $100 billion, wow, we're talking, what would that be, 1%? If he's just saying, oh, I'm going to run and hide, and I didn't get that extra 1%, 1% of $100 billion would be what? $10 million? So he didn't get that $10 million. No, 1% of $100 billion would be $1 billion. I'm sorry, I'm crazy. You got to help me here with this math. So he ran and hit at the wrong time. How often are those guys wrong? How often are they wrong? I don't know. How often do they lose their jobs? I don't know. I mean, you know what I mean? Is I'm, that's not my job as the monitor. That guy's got his job for a long time. He kind of looks like you. But don't tell him. I don't really have that many conversations with him. Actually, none up to this point. <laughs> so anyway, what I'm telling you is this is a sincere forecast. These money managers are making, they are sincere forecasts. This is genuinely, they stay up late at night and get up early in the morning. This is what they're thinking about. You know, like they don't have very often, I don't know about individuals, but this is not conducive to a good home life, right? You've got all this stuff just churning around in your stomach and in your head, and you're thinking about it, and you go, if you're wrong about interest rates, you lose your job, you know, this kind of stuff. And so these guys are thinking about it all the time. This is a really sincere bet, and when those interest rate differentials go up, that means that there are a number of money market managers, money managers, who are just going, this money's at risk, let's go. And if you don't say, oh, are you sure? They say, yeah, I'm sure, I wouldn't have moved it otherwise. Because it would be great if everybody else is wrong and they're running to hide from recession and they're wrong and I stay here, I get an extra 1%. Next year, I have their customers. So I'm running to hide too. That's because I think they're right. <laughs> I think I'm right. Yes, sir. Where do you find that type of information? Where do you find that? You know, you, you can find this just, I shouldn't say everywhere, but like Wall Street Journal's got this kind of database in there all the time. And they've got a yield curve in there every day, too, in the Wall Street Journal. And so when we start seeing that yield curve slope downward, this one, the forecast is recession from people who, and, and how would that show up? What they would start saying is this, hey, I think interest rates, short-term interest rates would be lower in the future than they are today. And then what they would say is, if I think short-term interest rates are going down, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to lock in today's rates. Because short-term interest rates, maybe today they're 5%. I think they're going to be 2% in a year or two. I want to lock in those rates. I'm going to make a lot of long-term loans. And so when they try to lock in those rates today before they go down, then long-term interest rates start going down. We get that negative whistle up yield curve. And so they're shifting money around, out of the short-term market into the long-term market. Yield curve, negatively slow. Why do they do that? Here's what, if they're wrong, you take that money out of that short market and you say, oh, I'm gonna lock in 5%. Today it's 5%, I'm gonna wanna lock that in because I think in the future it'll be 2%. What if next year it's 7%, the short-term interest rate, seven? Then you locked in five and you go, oh my gosh, I'm caught. I've locked in 5% for five or 10 or 20 years. I've locked that in and if I hadn't done that, I could be getting 7 or 8 or 10% short-term money in the future. Oh, I wish I hadn't locked that in at 5. But the guy across the street didn't. The guy across the street didn't go for that 5% long-term rate, didn't lock in, and so next year, he's investing at 7%, buying bonds that are yielding 7% or 8 and then the next year, your customers go, you did kind of lousy. You know, you got that 5% yield, but the guy across the street got 7 I think I'm just going to move my money across the street and let that guy manage it, because he seems to be doing a better job. Please stay, give me a chance. Yeah, you beat this guy, and I'll give you a chance. Right now, goodbye. This is, people aren't sentimental about this. This is money, right? And either this is your friend, or this is somebody you don't care to do business with. And so... You make a mistake, it counts, it's career stuff. And so what I'm telling you is as soon as that yield curve starts downhill, as soon as that risk differential starts up, there's somebody who cares an awful lot that's making a forecast. Pay attention. Yes, sir. How much do they have to keep in cash? Because if they've got that money locked in at five, they're going to get the money, but it's locked in at five. What are they, how does that work? 
what happens is if, if they block that in at 5% and they've got long-term bonds and then people come and say, hey, I want my money back, either they have some short-term liquid securities to pay those people off or they have to sell those bonds at a loss, right? Sell those bonds, hey, interest rates went up, you are locked in at five and interest rates went up. When you sell them, interest rates up, bond prices down, uh-oh. And so basically what happens is that company, that mutual fund company earned a loss this year. And then that manager whose compensation is partly based on how's the company doing, compensation down. Hey, you know how we normally give you a bonus? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's normal, but this is not normal, no bonus. Hey, how can that be? I was just gonna buy a cabin up at the lake and a new boat. Say, well, <laughs> now you're not. So, this is sincere stuff. I mean, they're putting money at risk there. It's not an empty forecast. It doesn't mean it's right, but these are sometimes used as, quote, leading indicators of what the economy is gonna be doing in the future. Leading indicators give us an advance notice of what the economy is going to do. Okay, I've spent quite a bit of time with this. We had rushed through the, at the very end of class last time, and I wanted to go through and sort of beef this discussion up a little bit. So if we have a steep uh, yield curve right now, what's that forecasting about the economy? Recession? Expansion? Expansion, maybe some inflation built in there. <laughs> I just told you a minute ago that economists can forecast, and you know, if they're wrong, who cares? Uh, it's these people that are making the financial bets that really count. So now I'm just gonna tell you, I don't really think there's that much expansion in the economy, but Maybe there is the inflation in the economy, but in terms of the economy going to be strong, I don't really see that right now. So maybe I wouldn't think the yield curve ought to be as steep, except maybe we'll have the inflation. So we'll just see. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, there are a whole range of things that create interest rate differentials. That is, between various categories of loans. We've talked about a couple, risk, default risk, and we just talked about term. How about taxes? We'll have three bonds, corporate bond, treasury bond, and then a municipal bond. And by a municipal bond, we mean a government bond, but not issued by the federal government, any other level of government, city, state, county, and so forth. Okay, and let's just put an interest rate on these of 5% to begin with. We'll talk a little bit more about that interest rate later on. And let's say these are $1,000 bonds in each case. In reality, municipal bonds tend to be $5,000 and up, but we're just gonna, we wanna get a comparable situation. In each case, what we're gonna have here is how much uh, interest income a year? Anybody? 5%, $1,000? You know, I didn't hear an answer, but that's probably because the audio is not working today on this. $50, $50 in interest income. And let's say your uh, federal income tax rate is 25%. It is for some people, it's not for everybody, but let's just say this. Let's say the state income tax rate 
is six uh, percent. So I get my fifty dollars in interest. I have to report that on my income tax return every April 15th. And so I've got to pay 25% of my income, pay $12.50, right, to the federal government in taxes, right? 25%, one fourth of $50 is $12.50. And I have to pay 6%, which would be $3, to the state government on income. And so I'd pay, I just said, $12.50 minus $3 is minus fifteen fifty and so what do I have here? Thirty four fifty? Is that right? Net. You tell me if I do the math wrong. Got a special deal for treasury bonds. Here's the deal. There is something called let me just write this term up here. There is a reciprocal agreement between the federal government and the state governments, states and cities and counties and so forth. And here's this reciprocal agreement. And by the way, originally there was thought to be some constitutional issue that required this. I'm not so sure how strong that argument is. But they still operate with this agreement. And here's what the agreement is. The federal government says to lenders, if you buy a municipal bond, city, state, county bond, if you buy a municipal bond and get interest income, we, the federal government, will not tax that income. And then reciprocal means it goes both ways. The city, states, counties say, if you, lenders, buy a bond issued by the treasury, we will not tax that income. Now, the federal government will still tax you. The federal government says, hey, you got $50 in income, minus $12.50, $37.50 is your net income. The federal government will tax you on the interest you receive from a government bond, federal government bond, treasury bond. But they won't tax you on the bond issued by a municipal government. And you don't have to pay that $3 of state income tax, some places they have a city income tax or earnings tax they sometimes call, you don't have to pay taxes on that. Nothing at the state or local level. Okay, So you get this municipal bond and you get $50 in interest and the federal government says, oh, I'm sorry, the state government says, back to our story, the federal government says you do not have to pay federal income tax on that. There's no $12.50 off. Now, here this is a little confusing, not too much. If you have a bond issued in a different state, let's say you have a California bond, our state will tax you on that interest income. But if you'll buy a bond issued in this state, a municipal <coughs> bond, our state won't charge you any income tax on that. So let's just pretend for the moment that you don't have, uh, that you buy a, a, a municipal bond issued in this state, there is no federal income tax. There is no state income tax. You keep $50. Okay, now which one of these do you like? Would you rather have $34.50, $37.50, or $50? Hmm, that's a hard one. Now, there are other issues involved in theory, these are the safest. And so we can go back and we talk about default risk, but right now what we want to do is find a situation where they are all equally risky. Let's say they're all triple A bonds. Then default risk isn't a consideration. What is a consideration? And the answer is taxes. Maybe they're all, to get term out of here, they're all 20-year bonds all 10-year bonds. We don't want term to be an issue. 
So what we have is a situation where there's supply and demand for each one of these. And what will happen is this. There will be some flight from the corporate bond, I'll say corporate, and we'll have a supply curve. And then the treasury, and then the municipal bonds. There will be flight from the corporate bonds, either to the treasuries, flight, supply will shift. There will be flight away from the corporate bonds to either treasuries or municipal bonds. And there will be flight from treasury bonds into municipal bonds to avoid taxes. And so what we'll have is this big decrease in the supply of, of credit to corporate bonds, a moderate decrease in the supply of credit to treasury bonds, and a big increase in the supply of credit to municipal bonds. And we talked before about these, and these are all called interest rate differentials. We can put a demand curve in each case to find out what's the price of credit going to be in each case. Okay, And so what we'll find is that there are interest rate differentials now. Interest rates are going to be very high on the corporate bonds, lower on the treasuries, and very low, by comparison, on the municipal bonds. Okay. Let's just come up with a little formula to tell us generally what's going to happen. And I don't want to make this as complicated as possible. So let's just compare the treasury bond with the municipal bond. I'll put IT and IM, the interest rate or the yield on these two bonds. With a compensating differential, interest rates are going to adjust to compensate for this. Here's what I'm really saying is, hey, since you don't have to pay income tax from holding municipal bonds, federal income tax, since you don't have to, you would love to have that kind of interest income. And so you will make a loan to these municipal governments even if they don't pay you a high interest rate because you get to keep all of that. Whereas if you own money here and you get a higher interest rate, you like that higher rate, but then you have to pay some of it in taxes. Okay, now, so after we've adjusted for taxes, our yields after tax yields are going to be the same on these. I on treasuries after tax, I after tax. Those are going to be equal. What's your after tax income going to be on a treasury bond? Here it's just going to be whatever you get on a municipal bond, no taxes, so after tax and before tax, those are all the same. But here's what we're going to have. There's the treasury bond interest rate minus the tax rate times the interest rate on treasury bonds. And then we can factor this out. It's the interest rate on treasury bonds times 1 minus the tax rate. This is a tax rate here. Twenty-five percent. So the interest rate on treasury bonds times one minus the tax rate, that would give us 75 percent net equals the interest rate on municipal bonds that we observe in the, stock, in the bond markets. Or we can divide both sides by the 1 minus the tax rate, and here's what we get. The interest rate on treasury securities equals the interest rate on municipal securities, the interest rate we observe in the marketplace, divided by 1 minus the tax rate. And we've did, done a little derivation here. So what I'm telling you is something like this. This is 75%, right? And so maybe this is 8%, and this would be 6%.
So if the treasury's got to pay eight, and I use those numbers because they're easy to deal with. Also, I could have used, what, four and three, and those would have been easy to deal with too. But it's just for the purposes of illustration. What I'm saying is this. If the treasury has to pay 8% to borrow, municipal government can pay 6% to borrow. Because you might say, hey, the treasury's paying eight. How come you aren't paying eight? And they just say, well, why don't you just lend your money to the treasury then? And you say, well, I hate to do that because if I lend to the treasury, I have to pay taxes. And they go, that's right. And if you lend to us, you don't. And you say, okay, here's my money. I wish you paid more. And they said, we understand. But we don't. We pay six. Do you want it or no? And you go, okay. Now, who's this most valuable to? This exemption from paying income taxes is most valuable to people who are in high income tax brackets. If you were in a 40% tax bracket, it means a whole lot more to you to not have to pay taxes than if you're in a 10% tax bracket. Okay? If you're in a 0% tax bracket, then you say, oh man, I'd love to have these because these are going to pay the highest interest rate of all because people will try to avoid these because of the taxes, but hey, if I'm in a 0% tax bracket, then I just think I'll go ahead and invest in those corporate bonds and get the highest interest rate. So it just depends on who cares about this the most. Okay, questions about this? Our final deal, I'll just take one more minute to talk about liquidity differences. Quantity of credit interest rate, interest rate, I'll put supply and demand 5% questions? Let's just talk about this, and I won't really put this in here for just a second. Quantity of credit to homeowners. We make loans to people who buy homes, yes? Yeah. And let's say the interest rate's 5%. More than a generation ago, the government came along and said something like this. Let's create this organization, really several, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and what these organizations will do is this, and I'm going to sort of run through this quickly. You don't need to know all the details, but here's what these organizations will do. It'll be an organization. The government sets it up. It will sell some bonds to borrow money with government backing. It will sell some bonds and borrow some money, let's say a billion dollars, and then go out and start buying with this billion dollars and notify bankers and savings and loans, hey, we're in the business of buying mortgages. And so then a banker says, hey, if I loan money to somebody to build a home, previously, previously, back in the old days, I had to hold on to that mortgage like for 30 years. And the person will pay and pay and pay and finally it's paid off. But that's illiquid. I can't turn it to cash. It's a loan. I'm locked in 30 years. But all of a sudden, along comes this organization, Fannie Mae, F. NMA, Federal National Mortgage Association, and Fannie Mae comes along and says, hey, we're buying mortgages. And they created liquidity in that market. And so for the mortgages that qualified, let's say qualify, don't qualify, for the ones that qualified for Fannie Mae to buy those mortgages, Bankers started saying, hey, I like making those kind of home loans now. It used to be when I'd make a home loan, I'm just locked in. The money's tied up for 30 years. Now it's not tied up even for 30 days. I can lend the money and any time I want and take the mortgage and sell it. And so that would increase the supply or the willingness of bankers to make those kind of loans because 
supply of credit starts flooding into those kind of loans. And it brought interest rates down. And so the government actually set Fannie Mae up, and these Jenny Mae and Freddie Mac and so forth, it set them up for the purpose of creating liquidity, and this is liquid, creating li liquidity in the market for mortgages, and then the supply of credit flooded into that market and lowered interest rates. And so we get another interest rate differential. If there's more liquidity in the market, interest rates are lower. That's it for today. So long.